Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at St. Paul United Methodist Church, downtown Ocean Springs. We thank you for joining us and pray that you will be blessed during this hour of worship. Let us begin with our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed historic a traditional version. Let us unite together in this historic creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat>
we now turn to God and unite our hearts in prayer, bringing to this, this place before us and from wherever you may be worshiping today, our, our prayers and concerns. We have a way of receiving those through our prayer ministry, as well as the other channels of communication that are available, including email and phone, of course, for hearing from you with personal concerns, as well as the broader ones that we bring to God in prayer as God's people. Please take advantage of those. We have a prayer ministry. Uh, you will see the link to that and the way to get in touch with them. Now it is our privilege to pray let it together as God's people. Let us do so. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the great love of Jesus Christ and for your presence with us in all times, times of joy, times of sorrow, sickness and health, faithfulness and brokenness. You are the God of heaven and earth, creator of all things, seen and unseen. And we Acknowledge as we believe, as we hear and believe in Scripture, that we join with the church through all ages, praying these prayers, praying that you would cast out all evil, that you would renew your creation and the face of the whole created order. Grant us your wisdom and courage as your people seeking to follow your way. Grant, grant them also to people who work in public service, including our political leaders, so that they may enact in our nation and in all nations for the common good, your justice. Grant us uh, a generosity, grant intelligence and generosity to leaders of business and industry so that they may provide dignity and safety for every person and household. Grant imagination and passion to educators and artists so that they give clear guidance and true vision, enabling their students and all to praise you for the wonder and beauty of your world. And we pray, O oh God, for strength and compassion and skill to our healers and our caregivers so that the sick and suffering may know your touch and that they, the caregivers themselves, may know your help in healing and in, in guidance. We pray this day for all who are suffering at the hands of those who are, are ill-intentioned we pray for those who are lonely, those who are suffering in body, our mind, our spirit, with powers that seem beyond their control. May they know your help in their time of trouble, and we pray that you would come swiftly to their aid as we hold up their well-being to you. Empower us, your church, as we, as we attend today to your word with the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel with authority that not even the gates of hell can withstand the grace of Jesus Christ and complete this renewal that you began in raising Jesus from the dead that until the time when we with all creation may shout hallelujah, amen. All these prayers we make in the name of Christ our Lord as we also together pray the words he taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is a good and right and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to God. And we do that as we worship with our offering. Thank you for your continued uh, gifts and support through this particular congregation of Christ Church. One, one reminder is that giving is easy. You may give online at, at give.stpaulos.org or through the mail, St. Paul UMC, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs. May God be praised as we continued, continue in the life and work of his kingdom. Let us pray together our offertory prayer. Thank you for filling, filling us, us with, with every spiritual grace that we might be a blessing for others. Consecrate, Consecrate the gifts we offer for the increase of your love. May they bring blessing to others and praise to your glorious name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God. 
Our scripture lesson today is Paul's words in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 through 23. Let us attend together to God's word. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? According to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who dwells all in all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're wrapping up our series on I am a church member today with the theme treasuring church membership as a gift. In beginning this topic, I want you to imagine uh, a child facing two different scenarios. In the first scenario, mom tells Johnny, son, you must clean your room now. It must be spotless. So Johnny goes to do what his mom tells him, and he realizes that he's probably going to put hours into these efforts, and that anything less than perfection is not acceptable. And whether he likes it or not, that room must be cleaner than it ever has been before. In the second scenario, mom tells Johnny, someone has given you an incredible gift, son, and it is wrapped and it is ready to open. And then she builds the excitement more by saying, you know, and son, this gift will be one of the greatest you've ever received or, or ever will receive. It will bring him countless hours of joy. Okay, so Johnny has the choice of scenario one or scenario two. What, what does he choose? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> of course, these two scenarios are unlikely, and I know the choice is obvious, but here's the thing. Every church member faces two distinct scenarios where the choice is just as obvious. There are two main ways that the first scenario comes into being and plays itself out, at least two of them, when we talk about church membership. And one way is what we mentioned at the beginning of this series uh, some four weeks ago, and that is approaching church membership like a country club membership. Simply put, we join the church to see what we can get out of it. It might go something like this, you know, the pastor uh, is here to feed us with his sermons and they are to be an acceptable length of time, not too long or not too short. The music is to fit our style exactly. If there are any deviations from these, you know, I'm just going to, that will be frowned upon and I will deem them unacceptable. The programs and ministries of the church, they're for my benefit. I will determine what I like and what I don't like and I expect perks, privileges, service, you know, for me. What happens if a country club member is asked to serve in a certain area, say in the nursery for a few weeks or to teach a junior high small group? The result is fairly predictable. The country club member agrees, you know, maybe will agree to the request out of obligation but she has a, a legalistic approach to serving. She begrudgingly accepts and begins this ministry with a not-so-good attitude. She won't last long. Others may even get upset simply for being asked to serve. You know, some may respond, you know, I did my time years ago. They make ministry sound like a prison sentence. And still others may refuse to offer a reason, you know, why they won't contribute. They are simply indignant that you even asked them. Still another group of country club members gets angry at the pastors. After all, you know, that's what we pay them to do. Those pastors are just lazy trying to get out of work. This is one way that uh, 
the first scenario of the church membership plays out. The other way is the first, uh, this first option plays out is that we set out to discover our own firsthand faith because this is what our hearts really hunger for. And sometimes we have a notion about this and sometimes we do not. But we are disillusioned with the church. And I believe there are a significant number of people in this category, maybe particularly young people. It doesn't take them long to see how imperfect the church can be. It doesn't take them long at all. And that makes them certain that the church is the problem. And guess what? The problem with that view is that the church is not the problem. The church is constituted, created by God. The problem is their view and definition of church itself. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and this is the message paraphrase, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part in the body does your part mean anything. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes by the grace of God, folks come to understand the church is not a building or it's not a pastor, it's not a sermon series because it's easy to point out everything wrong with the church, especially when you're standing outside of it and approaching it with some kind of consumer mentality. Then you begin to see that the truth was that they had chosen uh, to avoid a firsthand relationship with the community of Christ when they claimed to have tried it out before. Now, some will argue that the body of Christ, and this is kind of an aside, but it's an important one, the body of Christ refers to the universal church. The universal church means all believers everywhere for all ages. They would be right. But the universal church and the local church are not mutually exclusive. To the contrary, the majority of New Testament books are written to uh, four local churches. You look at the book of Acts, it provides a, an historical narrative of the Holy Spirit's work of churches in Jerusalem, in Antioch, in Cyprus, in Antioch of Pisidia, in Inconium, in Lystra, in Pamphylia, in Macedonia, in Thyatira, in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Athens, in Corinth, in Thess Caesarea, in Ephesus, in Troas, in Rome, in Malta, well, you get the idea. And look how many New Testament books were written to specific local churches. You'll recognize these names more readily. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. Four of Paul's books were written to individuals in specific churches. And even the book of Revelation has the context of letter to local churches, letters to local churches. The Bible is clear we are baptized into and made part of the universal church, it is just as clear that we are connected to a specific church in a specific context. That gets to the heart of it all. You are the body of Christ. You are the church. The amazing truth is that you are a member of this most powerful, intimate, and meaningful community in history. God didn't design you to be part of the body of Christ and to come into a second-hand relationship in some way, lounging on the sidelines of life. God wants you to experience deep and rich community in his body. That brings us to the second option to church membership. It's the biblical option that sees membership as a gift, as something to be treasured. Membership means that we have the opportunity to not only receive, but for that is a big part of it, but also to serve and to give rather than the legalistic option to do so. Our entire attitude, indeed, our, our approach to the world is changed when we approach membership in the biblical way. The truth is, you know, we can come up with plenty of excuses not to get involved. Uh, our, our reasons that your church has it wrong but if we're dealing with scriptural Christianity, you can't get away from the question, when was the last time you looked inside your, yourself and, and really searched your own heart for the issues? It takes, it takes some of us a long time to understand 
that the source of our secondhand faith isn't the church per se, it's, it's in our own hearts. Biblical Christianity says it's impossible to live a completely first-hand faith, that first-hand faith that we really all are hungering for, without living out the faith in the community of Christ's followers that God has placed among you or around you. And we need every bit of support we can get to live out that first-hand faith in this spiritually dangerous world. I was nurtured in the womb of a relatively small church in a small town in central Mississippi. It was far from perfect, but it was made up of some devoted souls who I will forever revere as my own personal saints. But again, the congregation was far from perfect. In fact, it wasn't until the last decade when uh, Dr. Joe Reif of the Mississippi Conference wrote his groundbreaking work about Mississippi Methodism in the 1960s that I knew how imperfect my home congregation was. Uh, Joe researched the crisis in this amazing work of his uh, of the civil rights movement in Methodist congregations in our state during those years with individuals, personal stories of how some of our clergy, some of our ministers literally went through hell as a result. Um, uh, it was the result of the stands that they took in those volatile times, etc. And his book documents how my hometown church, the church that nourished me in the faith, the church that gave me hope, that called me to the ministry, was known as one of the embattled congregations over this issue. And how Reverend Elton Brown accepted the call to go there for one year. I remember Reverend Elton Brown well. He just died this last year. But when he came to our church in 1967, I was in the second grade. And what I remember of the time that Reverend Brown was there was his, he was Elton himself, his wife Juliet, and his youngest daughter Virginia, who was my classmate for one year. And the fact that Reverend Elton had arranged for a pool table to be placed in the fellowship hall. <laughs> I was oblivious to the fact that when Reverend Brown arrived, that our church, he had found a church paralyzed by fear, unwilling to take a stand as real Methodists, unquote. And while he was there, he challenged the church and the church leaders there to, to get off the fence to decide whether they were going to be true to their Christian faith is what it amounted to. But after he was there about one year, June 1967, he surprised them by announcing on Sunday that he would move later that week. Repentant of the year's conflicts, several members came to see Reverend Brown before he left. One church leader told him his impending departure had waked them up and, and they were now prepared to be a better church. In his humble way, Brown concluded he did more good for them by leaving than anything else he had done that year. Well, the church is far from perfect. But I want to ask you, did that crisis, did that imperfection of that congregation in any way nullify all the other things that it did to nurture me and my sister and my classmates in the Christian faith and to include us in its care, as we say in our membership vow. Mm. Years later, I was pastoring Decatur United Methodist Church and went to a special Sunday evening service there in Raymond, Raymond United Methodist Church, for a dedication of, a new, of new stained glass windows that were highlighted, this service did, several people spoke of the significance of members in the church for whom the windows were given in their honor and why, why they were meaningful in their lives and what they had done. And when we sang that final song of that service, Shalom to You, it, it was one of the most powerful moments in my adult life. I want to tell you, I was one of several folks who found themselves with tears running down their face. What's my point? Church membership is a gift. It is a gift from God. It is a gift to be treasured with great joy, 
with anticipation. We never know how far reaching that firsthand faith will be that touches the heart, that forms people in the faith, that touches human need. So understand the gift as you receive it, because church membership is a gift to be treasured. It should never be taken for granted or considered lightly. Because it is a gift, we are to always be thankful for it. It goes without saying, when we are thankful for something, we have less time and energy to be negative. And when we receive a gift with true appreciation, we naturally want to respond to the giver. We see service to the giver uh, you know, as a natural outflow of, of the joy of our salvation and the consequent joy of our church membership. We consider it a privilege to serve the king. And so we look for opportunities in the church, as the church, where we serve. When we receive a gift, we respond to the appreciation of the giver's entire family with appreciation. And other church members who have received the gift of salvation, who are as well adopted sons and daughters of God, just as we are, are both recipients and givers themselves. Are we perfect? <laughs> uh, no more than I'm, I or you. Uh, are we hypocrites? Yeah, just as much as you and I. But is it possible because of the abundant joy that we receive for the gift of God's grace to serve other, ch other church members with that same joy? Yeah. The bottom line is when we see life and God's grace and church membership as gifts, uh, you know, our whole perspective changes. We don't have any sense of entitlement, any sense of expectation. To the contrary, we want to be, often want to be last, to receive the least, because that's what we saw Jesus did and what we see Jesus does. And we want to be more like him. And so our pledge, our fifth pledge today and final pledge in this, this series, I Am a Church Member, is about receiving church membership of, as a gift. And it goes like this. This membership is a gift. Through baptism, I became a part of the body of Christ, the same Jesus Christ, through whom I, am, I have received the free gift of salvation. And now I am humbled and honored to serve and to love others in our church. I pray that I will never take my membership for granted, but see it as a gift and an opportunity to serve others and to be part of something so much greater than any one person or member. What a pledge. I invite you to take that pledge and sign it not only on paper, but in your own heart as a pledge that we seek to fulfill, that God certainly is calling us not only not only to be true to, but to enjoy and treasure. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See. Let us joyfully sing together. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my Bye.
Go forward this week in the strength of God's holy presence. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit abide with you always. See you next time. Mm -hmm.